Welcome everybody to the seventh lecture in our From the Rooftops Summer Lecture Series. Uh, these lectures are coming to you from the Faculty in the Landscape Architecture Department here in the Weizmann School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. My name is Richard Weller, I'm the Chair of the Department and today it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Sean Burkholder. Uh, Sean is the Andrew Gordon Assistant Professor of Landscape Architecture here at Penn. He's also the director of the Landscape Affairs Group, a landscape research and design consultancy focused on the human entangled freshwater ecosystems of post-industrial landscapes. The relationship between these issues and their experiential understanding are the subject of his forthcoming book, Due Out Any Day. The book is titled Curious Methods and it is co-authored with Karen Lutsky. Sean is also working on a new book regarding inland water bodies worldwide. Sean's research into inland water bodies and industrial ecologies of siltation manifests at the moment in a major research project. No doubt he will talk about this a little bit today. This project is titled Healthy Port Futures um, and it's supported by the Great Lakes Protection Fund. To do this research, he is working in close collaboration with a range of local and federal agencies. This research project stresses the inherent value of landscape design research in the process of maritime infrastructure projects that typically otherwise would only aim at single value outcomes. Underpinning all of his work is a particular interest in the way in which substrate and ecology influence the urban landscape and how these systems are interpreted by others. Sean lectures and serves as a design critic internationally. His work has been widely exhibited and published. Sean holds an undergraduate degree in architecture from Miami University and an MLA in landscape architecture from the Harvard GSD. So please join me in welcoming Sean to our digital lectern today. Enjoy the lecture. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Burkholder. I'm an assistant professor of landscape architecture here at the Weizmann School. Uh, and I'd like to get, uh, begin today just by welcoming um, our whole class of new students. Uh, welcome to the program and the department. Uh, and for those of you who are continuing in the program or from elsewhere, um, I certainly hope that this, uh, this talk today will be, um, if nothing else, uh, entertaining for all of you. So um, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for joining. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so uh, today uh, the talk I'm going to give is called On Time, um, Landscape as Event. Uh, and the, the talk today is composed primarily of um, work, a uh, collection of work that I, I've been doing in some cases with colleagues, um, looking at the role of time within the practice and, and uh, research of landscape architecture. Uh, it contains material both from my forthcoming book on Curious Methods, uh, which is co-authored with Karen Lutsky, in addition to some material from a chapter I've recently written for a book called Waste Matters, um, which is edited by Nicole Bouchard. Um, this material will be supplemented throughout with uh, other other material so um and i'll note that uh, so so to begin um i just have to say that uh i just confess you know that i am not a i'm not a physicist or a philosopher yet i will draw liberally from both discipline disciplines to interweave concepts that illustrate my points um and will likely do so in ways that will be um, I assume ghastly to representatives from either of those disciplines. Um, I'm also going to attempt to remain relatively neutral in my positions regarding the ongoing disciplinary battles uh, being waged on the subject of time within both philosophy and physics, um, as there are certainly disagreements. Uh, and these arguments that I'm mentioning are really ones that are only happening within the disciplines themselves and don't really even hint at the disagreements between the two disciplines, an example of which was wonderfully described in a, in a book called The Physicist and the Philosopher by Hermina Canales, um, who charted the interactions between uh, Albert Einstein and Henry Bergson uh, in the early 1900s. So if two of the greatest minds of the earliest 20th, 20th century couldn't reach a conclusion um, or a consensus on the subject of time, there's probably little hope for us pretending that we're going to um, reach a conclusion over the course of this talk. Uh, that said, 
I do believe there's a need for a continual reconsideration of the nature of time within the discipline of landscape. This continual reconsideration is necessary for two reasons. First, because our knowledge of the physics of time, like pioneered by uh, Einstein and others, uh, is continually evolving. Um, and second, the, the continually changing and dynamic nature of our world, as proposed by Bergson and others, um, describes our world as one that is ever becoming. Um, so for these reasons, things are both ontologically and epistemologically changing constantly. This necessitates a continuous process of review and revision uh, to our engagement of the theory of time. Now, there are plenty of reasons why this continual recapitulation may also be wholly unnecessary or unhelpful. Mark Kingwell, in the first chapter of the LA Plus issue on time, laments the lack of definitive results provided by a long history of philosophers writing about time. Um, he ends with the statement, time is a prison and there is no forever. Physicist Lee Smolin would also likely fall into this camp of thinkers who would prefer to get beyond all of this anti-realist speculation and really try to figure out what time actually means. Um, from what I have taken from his writing, um, time is everything uh, and universal. Uh, and he would likely disagree with some of the positions I'm going to propose here, particularly regarding the subjectivity of time. And while I'm sympathetic to, and at times incorporative of, these pragmatic agendas, I urge that we not be too dismissive of any viewpoint or method that could potentially lead to new discoveries or inspiration, particularly as we work within the flux of landscape. Conveniently, we are not physicists or philosophers, and like we have for so long from the disciplines of art, architecture, and ecology, um, we can draw from these disciplines uh, for the things that we find most helpful as we think about the landscape. So if there's ever been a topic that is regularly wielded by the discipline of landscape architecture as a way to discern us from other practices, um, it would be the idea of time. With paraphrased adages such as, on the first day after construction, a piece of architecture looks its best and a landscape looks its worst. We profess that landscapes take time. We know this to the point that it has become a trope. Yes, a plant will grow, water will flow, the wind will blow. Most of us consider these things as common sense. And yet here we are, hanging our disciplinary hat on common sense as the thing that differentiates us and makes us special. It's not much different than me assuming that I should be paid extra for understanding that water runs downhill. Yet I don't mean to be dismissive. I honestly believe that time is one of the most fundamental and compelling concepts informing our work in landscape. However, the flow of time is common and familiar and using it as something that makes landscape special is perhaps less interesting than looking at how little other disciplines accept its effects. Architecture and engineering seeming lack for consideration regarding the common sense of time can be daunting. The fascination with things and their longevity is still a primary preoccupation of many of our sister disciplines, uh, and many landscape architects for that matter. Uh, but all critique aside, I believe we honestly still appear on solid intellectual ground as we continue to lean in on this idea of time as something that we are particularly trained to address. Our comfort in riding the fence between disciplines, be they art and science, or physics, physics and philosophy, um, is yet another thing that we claim as landscape architects, our ability to synthesize between positions and perspectives. And while this is a well-worn assertion, it is also, like our engagement with time, something that I believe does positively color uh, our contribution to the world. That said, our use of time in many cases feels tremendously hubristic, uh, as we speak passionately about what we believe will happen. Even for those in landscape, time becomes simply the description of desired future states based on intuition at best. In many cases, these descriptions are nothing more than an optimistic vision used to describe a project over time, typically uh, a future where things simply get bigger. Knowing full well that the unruly and stochastic nature of the world we know, along with our professional liability insurance, will relieve us from having to actually predict the future with any real accuracy. So we'll come back to this idea of prediction, intuition, and vision in the practice of landscape architecture a bit later. Um, but for now, I'd like us just to step back and think a little bit more critically about this idea of time itself. So part one is called, What is Time? Uh, and so for this discussion, I'm going to pull considerably from two recent texts. The first is James Glick's recent book on the history of time travel. The other is uh, a book called The Order of Time by Carlo Rovelli. There are other references sprinkled into this lecture, but I have found that these two to be incredibly bold in their breadth and clarity, and we recommend them to anyone. Uh, the LA Plus issue on time um, 
which is something that most of you hopefully have some uh, knowledge of, provides one of the more inspiring collections of design-specific musings on the subject, um, and also the time issue of the Whitechapel Gallery's Documents of Contemporary Art, um, this one edited by Amelia Kroom, um, also contains a good collection of, of texts and examples from artists and theorists. So if you find yourself deeply interested in the subject matter, these are very good places to start. There is little consensus about the definition of what time is, or even if it exists. Most dictionaries end up relying on a circular definition uh, that links time with terms like period, duration, continuum, interval, or even the word change. And yet the definition of each of these words relies on the definition of time. There have been some interesting attempts at a definition. Um, Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman uh, once said that uh, time is what happens when nothing else does. Uh, another physicist, John Wheeler, um, also, and Woody Allen, have both been quoted saying, time is nature's way of keeping everything from happening all at once. St. Augustine, the philosopher who thought about time a really good deal, noted that he understood time quite well right up until the point where he had to explain it. Now, this list of examples could go on, but what it indicates is that time itself is a word or concept, and it depends on its interpretation. Time provides us with a model for the world we experience, a model that helps us better understand, calculate what has and will happen. Time is in no way perfect or ideal. And while Lee Smolin would likely disagree with me, for now, I think it's helpful for us maybe to stress that time is also in no way objective. So part two, the standard practice of marking time. For the sake of progress, uh, let's see. For the sake of progress in this presentation, let's leave the arguments associated with the definition and reality of time behind us. Like St. Augustine and others, let's just agree that we generally know what time is, but we probably have a difficult time trying to describe it. It seems to me that the vast majority of the creative work focused on time falls under the category of marking it. This, this work knowingly or unknowingly builds on the entangled nature of both time and change. Time is a measure of change, and change is only measurable with some kind of time variable. Artists and designers alike have been fascinated by this operation of marking time in order to demonstrate change. In landscape design, we are overrun with projects that index change in various ways, uh, but most of this work is unhinged from some variable of time. One of the more successful attempts, in my opinion, of a process and performance-based work that does feel somewhat strategically tied to the idea of time and context uh, would be Lawrence Halperin's scores uh, as part of his RSVP cycles. Here, possibilities are played out knowing that not all things are ever equal or equally represented and that our inability to predict the future could actually be seen as a generative force. Photography and even painting has a long history also of this marking of time. Um, and as our techniques and technologies develop, you can uh, assume that our um, skills at doing this will continue to expand. Um, some um, older historical examples here from Marcel Duchamp with new descending staircase number two, um, and then images from both uh, Marais and Moybridge studying the movement of a horse and a rider um, through different um, time photography sequences uh, were some of the kind of first earliest examples of, of this of this exploration. Um, more contemporary work um, has stretched that um, further uh, and so we see work here from the RISD based artist Dennis, Dennis Helinski. Um, more of that. Uh, work that our, our colleagues here at, at Penn have worked on um, with the Anu and Dilip with SOAK. And the work that we've been conducting uh, over the past couple of years, looking at the movement of vegetation, um, the documentation of, of, of trips or a, a series of events, uh, and then looking at larger time scales as ways of calling attention to particular geologic features in this case. Um, so our modern history of time has in many ways been tied tightly to the to celestial processes and most commonly the movement of the sun across the sky, which of course is not the sun's movement, but our own. Uh, the tracking of the sun and other bodies beyond the earth has been a common theme for many artists. Some obvious examples include the work of environmental artists such as Robert Morris with its, his observatorium in Holland on the left um, and Charles Ross's star axis on the right. 
Of course, another very obvious example would be Nancy Holt's sun tunnels from 1976. Um, here looking at the idea that uh, we can frame a series of views or a series of celestial events through some tunnels. So thinking again, we'll come back to this idea of an event. Um, but here that event is twofold. Um, of course, the event happens, the sun shines through this um, at a particular time of the year, um, but along with it is the event associated with people actually coming to see it. And so um, it becomes an interesting um, nested uh, condition of events, of events here. So how I'm going to break this work, uh, I'm going to kind of uh, talk about time in a series of, of frames. Um, I'd like to talk about several of the characteristics of time and uh, interpretations that I think might be constructive when we think about it um, in the terms of landscape. Uh, I'm going to call these interpretations time frames um, as they seek to construct a particular lens or frame to possibly understand our work through the configuration of various ideas, primarily through physics and philosophy. Uh, they are by no means the only possible frames, nor are they unrelated to one another. They are only my personal takes on a series of configurations that may open more doors to the work we do with a particular focus on this idea of time that we are purportedly so invested in. So frame number one. The past is no future or the problem of prediction. This frame is probably the most straightforward and clearly applicable to our work in landscape architecture, primarily because it is a reflection of what we presently do. We all have produced projects that describe a future desired condition, something that is likely not based on either the methods of prediction that use the path to methodically guess at, fut at the future, uh, or of projection that use mathematical probability to suggest future states. Instead, we typically just throw, show things growing larger over time. It is a gross generalization of our intuition of how things change, a generalization that contradicts many of our lived experiences. As a process, it rounds off the edges of what we experience and discredits things do not, that do not happily line up with our expectations. So recently I watched this street tree get ripped up and ripped in half by a street cleaning truck on my street. Um, its future will not be a bigger version of its past, but instead it will be a reshaped one. And for a couple of years, its future will actually be a smaller, uh, will be smaller than its past. Things are complicated and do not just dumbly flow from small to large. So finding ways of acknowledging this reality is one of the more interesting undertakings I believe we should be invested in. What are these everyday experiences or glitches that contradict what we consider common sense in our overall generalizations of the world? And how can we empower them? Or put another way, how can we deliver agency to systems or events that run counter to preconceived order uh, that perhaps is not even in order at all? Uh, we should stop rounding off the corners because in many cases it's the corners that make things important or meaningful, uh, not the neat boxes that we have shoehorned everything into. At the scale of landscape, we make giant assumptions about how things work and seldom do they include the anomalous events that we experience daily or recognition of the ranging rates of change associated with our world. One of the most obvious examples uh, that I observe in design projects is the prediction of technology. Projects that claim to have a plan for 50 years in the future which is a scale that does work reasonably well for the growth of woody vegetation or large erosion patterns, uh, will simply gloss over what the future may actually be like technologically, as if trees and soil are to totally disconnected from technology. At a minimum, a project would look back into the past 50 years, ask questions about how the world has changed over those 50 years, uh, and then project that rate of change forward 50 years um, to get an understanding of what the future might look like. But this process naively assumes that change over time happens linearly, so thus making prediction somewhat of a straightforward process. Looking at technology in particular, which is a character that shows up in many of our long-term predictions, the change over time is not linear at all. It's actually logarithmic, meaning that the past 50 years cannot predict the coming 50 years at all beyond the fact that the rate of increase will itself increase. It becomes almost impossible to imagine what 50 years in the future might look like, assuming that technology has anything to do with it. And there are plenty of venues exploring this subject matter. Perhaps one of the most entertaining and comprehensive is the Paleo Future blog, which is now hosted on the Gizmodo website. So if you're interested in how badly we have historically missed the mark on our guesses of the tech of the future, this is a fun place to start. One of the more interesting historical collections uh, of this kind of work comes from the French artist John Marc Cote uh, in, a, in a project that he worked on in 1900. Um, this was a set of cards that depicted various inventions or situations that would exist in the year 2000. Science fiction uh, author Isaac Asimov, best known for his Foundation series, published a book called Future Days in 1986 that featured this set of cards. 
Not surprising is the vast discrepancy between the 2000 we remember and what was shown by Cote. In 50 years, do you think we'll actually be planting trees to address climate change? Um, that doesn't mean that we won't be, uh, that it doesn't make sense to do it now, but making the assumption that it'll be the best practice in 50 years, uh, when 50 years ago, we could hardly make a computer talk to another computer and the internet was still 20 years away, seems like a relatively lazy and uncommitted, uh, uncommitted uh, engagement with the idea of time. Um, and so when you can see these images, some of which became quite, actually quite real, this idea of, of a machine that bred chickens uh, here. So you see eggs going in one side and the chickens coming out the other. We're not far from this at all. Um, but clearly the um, winged mailman and the underground um, croquet game uh, are a bit of a, of a, of a missed, uh, a miss, I, I suppose. So things don't just flow uh, from small to large, uh, but time itself does flow, right? Um, since at least the times of Heraclitus, the metaphor of time as a river that flows has been predominant, and it's hard to find a text that does not mention it. Uh, common sense does, not, does seem to support this idea that time moves from the past through the present uh, and into the future. Experience supports this, as do particular parts of physics. Many refer to this as time's arrow, something coined by Sir Arthur Eddington, and it only goes one direction. It is this arrow that formed Kingston's prison that we mentioned at the beginning of, uh, of the talk. Uh, we have yet to find a way to go back in time, or should I say that Einstein and others discovered or at least predicted how to do it, but it does involve getting incredibly close to a black hole. Um, so for now, let's consider it at least highly unlikely, if not impossible. While experience strongly validates this arrow of time, many equations in physics, uh, many equations in physics are actually time symmetrical, meaning that they work both forward and backward uh, without concern for time. You simply change the positive to a negative and things flow neatly into the past and the math all seems to work out, or so I'm told. Uh, moving balls are a favorite example when describing this kind of thing, so we'll stick to those. So we can show a video of a ball moving across a table, or in this case a floor, um, in one direction. We can play that movie backward, um, and the videos feel fine. There's nothing odd about it. Um, honestly, Newton's laws of movement apply equally to both of these. And so um, even though the second ball is actually moving backwards in time, there is nothing that feels overly strange about, about that situation. Um, it's when objects come to a rest or come to a stop uh, where things begin to become difficult. Um, so if we slowly watch this ball come to a rest on my incredibly uneven floor, um, and then we get, begin playing that movie backwards, which we'll, we'll begin momentarily. Um, we begin seeing uh, an object going from a stationary position to a moving one without any help. This video defies the second law of thermodynamics, uh, that systems move from states of lower entropy to states of higher entropy. Um, we simply know that a ball cannot start moving on its own. And so watching a video like this um, is somewhat creepy. Filmmakers have been using this to great effect. Um, and one of the most memorable, at least for me, is the final scenes in Andrei Tarkovsky's film, Stalker. Um, here, uh, we see the stalker's daughter uh, named Monkey uh, at the very end of the film. Um, she's uh, mute and also has uh, some disabilities associated with her father's occupation, taking people into a highly polluted landscape. Um, and as she, as she sits and begins to stare at this, at this glass, we see the glass begin to move across the table. Um, now this, uh, of course, as we've said, defies the second law of thermodynamics. Um, and again, looks, looks odd. That's the, the effect that this uh, happens, that this is something that um, is simply not normal or, 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 or common. Um, if we played this video backwards, and uh, in certain ways, the idea that we could very easily slide a glass over to this woman, um, and have the glass stop in front of her, um, like a bartender might do at a bar, um, and that would feel much less strange than watching, um, watching this. Um, and this has been a kind of a favored technique um, for, for quite a while. Um, so what we'll do is, is here we'll kind of show, uh, this is a video um, from 1895 by the Lumaire brothers of France. Uh, this is the mechanical butcher. This was thought by some to be one of the first science fiction films ever made. Um, and the, and the, 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 the joy here is you watch the, you watch the pig come in one side and then um, like this giant machine has like turned it into all of the meat, meat parts. 
um, that it is uh, that we associate with the pig. What the Lumiere brothers did uh, in about 1900 is they then started showing this film going backwards. Uh, so the, the the pig was then all of the the meat products were put back into the right hand side of this machine, um, and then of course, like disobeying the second law of thermodynamics, um, the pig uh, was then was then formed. Uh, so we'll look. In 1904, um, that subject matter was taken a little bit more seriously by the Edison Studios, um, who instead of having to play their video backwards, actually built it into the into the subject of the story itself. Um, again, I, I feel I I feel confident that um, neither of these uh, films ended up hurting any animals. So we hope that's the that's the case. Um, and so here we'll quickly just kind of watch this video. It's relatively humorous, and so it should be fun to see. Um, but here we have a, an invention, the draw dog transfer mater, uh, and we see a and then what looks to be a relatively disturbing collection of, of what looks like sausages on the wall behind us. Um, and and so while this is quite old uh, and a little disturbing, it's also pretty um, uh, humorous and psychologically compelling. So we see the dogs um, getting added to the machine. They come out as sausages on the other side. Um, so we, uh, and of course they're conveniently categorized by dog type. So that was a plain dog. Um, this is a different, different dog. This is a trained dog. So it gets put under the trained dogs. And this is a little Boston Terrier. We used to have a Boston Terrier. Um, there we go. Boston Terrier turned into sausage. So, um, if we leave it at that, this is pretty disturbing. Um, and, uh, but also somewhat straightforward if we can get beyond the strange subject matter. Um, but what becomes then incredibly odd is we realize that these aren't sausages to be consumed, but they actually become a, a method of storing the dogs. Uh, the, you know, this man is getting his spaniel, comes out. Um, and so what this is doing again is this kind of this questioning the second law of thermodynamics, the idea that we would go from something um, of high order, like an animal, into something of a lower order, like a, a sausage that's been processed. Uh, and then we can then reanimate that uh, lower piece of energy into something that is a higher, higher form of energy, which is a living, another living animal, living dog in this case. Um, and so it makes for a, a, a funny, interesting story, although it, it um, totally runs counter. So this woman picked the dachshund, the dachshund bit everyone, so they put the dachshund back into the machine. It's also another advantage of this system, clearly. Uh, and then we can, we're going to try a terrier. Um, the woman seems quite happy with her selection, and it's great. So we now have, so I'll keep chatting a second. This video goes on for a bit longer, um, but we'll, um, uh, and so I'll let it play for a couple of seconds before I move on. Um, so while at the molecular level, there are many processes that are mathematically and temporally symmetrical, the world that we experience uh, and that we inhabit is overwhelmingly filled with events that are thermodynamically tied. Uh, in many ways, uh, the world that we know is, is, is heat-based. Uh, and so this heat-based world um, follows Eddington's arrow of time. Um, so if this is how many of us experience the world, it makes sense that we just take this condition as a given uh, and then use the information of the past to begin speculating on um, what exists in the present and what could happen in the future. This process is called abductive reasoning and it is something that we use every day to navigate the world. We use the evidence we have, um, including past experiences, to make a sense of what we observe in the present. Uh, sometimes this is also called inference to the best explanation. Uh, we observe an effect and then speculate on its causes. And while this process is something that many of us consider common sense, it doesn't take long to see where it could go wrong uh, uh, as we use it to project into the future. Because in that case, neither cause and effect or given. The evidence that we use um, is information that we have on hand. Um, it could be any experience, it could be any written text or any event from our past whatsoever. There's far too much evidence. And so we have to choose and we can't choose at all. And then, of course, this gets fed into, of course, the unpredictability of time. Logic has served us reasonably well in making guesses about what something is. Um, it has also failed many times, too. But, uh, but because we have some record of past events that accompany it, um, we, uh, we tend to be a bit more successful. 
um, what something might be in the future becomes much more challenging. Remember Cote's underwater croquet game, for example. We certainly have not reached that future, um, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, so arguing that something, uh, arguing about whether or not the, the leaves of my mangled street tree are green, assuming we have in a general agreed upon idea about what green is, um, is a relatively silly debate. Um, but figuring out whether or not they will be green in the future is another thing altogether. Um, they could change color in the fall or due to an injury, uh, due to this injury, they could turn brown and die. Um, or yes, they could even stay green depending on the type of tree it is. Um, you can't answer what will be without answering when. And when, of course, is a tied to the unpredictable nature of time. Um, while it can work and is done constantly, either through simple intuition um, or complex sim simulation modeling, assuming that the past will predict the future is not always the best method because time can and likely will screw something up. Now, I personally find the use of experiment as a useful tool to begin to understand the change at the, la change at the landscape scale. This amounts to the idea of understanding the work that we do as landscape architects as probes or tests into a complex set of contextual conditions. Instead of assuming that we know what will happen in the future, the experiment accepts its ignorance and asks new questions about the present. The process of design becomes about learning as opposed to solving, it becomes about finding over fixing. Obviously, science has a long tradition of experimentation, and while every project ever constructed as landscape architecture could also be understood as an experiment, we seldom conceive our projects in that way. This is not to say that the objectives of experimentation are not to address challenges. Um, it is that seldom within landscape do we see our work as experimentation. Um, this here is a, is a science, exp is an experiment being conducted uh, by the University of Minnesota. I'm at the Cloquet Research Forest here in, nor in northern Minnesota. Um, which is which is where they're actually modifying um, um, or controlling the amount of water and the amount of heat in the soil uh, to uh, to um, to simulate climate change and looking at how the vegetation responses um, of different plants uh, see what those responses are um, and so this here is a science experiment like out in the landscape. The Dutch sand motor uh, is another example of a, of a project uh, that I, I think I certainly find compelling along with others. Um, but this is actually more of a scientific and engineering project and it's not something that many would associate with landscape architecture. Now some of the work that we've been doing for our Healthy Port Futures project um, does lean on the idea of the experiment. So instead of attempting to predict the future, we've developed a set of experimental methods, both in the lab, which you can see, which you can see here, and out in the field to better understand the complex dynamics that inform coastal conditions. Now these conditions are tremendously difficult to model accurately, and many design projects in this territory are myopically over-engineered to simply absorb the range of possible conditions. Instead of being sensitive and responsive to the forces around them, coastal infrastructures have a tendency to block, absorb, and withstand these forces to promote comfort uh, within our change-averse society. So uh, some of uh, the constructed experiments uh, that we've been working on uh, attempt to interact and leverage the contextual forces of a particular context text, uh, through a particular sensitivity to them. Um, the results of these interactions then are highly monitored and then used to inform future interactions in a process of adaptive management uh, as opposed to control. Uh, in this first example, you can see the, the, a, a plan for a project that was constructed in Port Bay, New York, uh, where we took dredged sediment from the channel. On the left, we moved it to the east, um, where it would be exposed to wind and wave energy, and then that material was then um, deposited over the, uh, along the shoreline. Um, in an area of the barrier bar that has been historically breached. Uh, and another example in Illinois, in Illinois Beach State Park in Illinois, uh, a series of submerged ridges underneath the, underneath the water um, modify the wave energy that comes across them to both protect uh, uh, an endangered wetland that's on shore, um, in addition to modifying the way sediment transport uh, along the longshore moves in this image from left to, to right. Um, and so again, like thinking about what the effects of this, uh, of this operation uh, would be. Uh, and then all of these, again, as we've mentioned, are then highly monitored to understand um, what actually happens um, in response to the, the, uh, the constructed piece, so the experiment. 
So the takeaway here could simply be that we should be more creative, bold, and visionary in our speculations of the future, because we will be getting it wrong no matter what we say or show. Uh, instead, thinking of landscape design as a series of experiments and adaptations in time may more constructively tether us to these temporal conditions of the world that we seem so committed to. So that's frame number one. Frame number two, between tree time and bee time, or the subjectivity of now. As mentioned before, time is not an objective enterprise, physically or experientially. A good deal of the work of Newton attempted to describe a universal time by which we could measure all things. The work of Einstein and certain quantum theorists that followed him have now shown that this idea of the universal time is likely an illusion. Time is relative to the observer. Time can move more slowly or quickly depending on our location in relation to gravitational objects or our velocity. Moving faster slows down time. Being closer to the center of a gravitational object also slows down time. And while the differences in location and velocity need to be immense indeed for them to be perceptible, the differences in time between the top of my desk and the floor, or me standing still and the person walking next to me, um, are actually calculable and well understood. In this way, there is no common now. Irregardless of what we experience, it is a fact that your time and my time are mathematically different, even if only by millions or trillions of a second. As our distances apart increase, or, this, or we have a higher rate of change in our velocities, um, our times will diverge more dramatically. Now, we, we seldom find ourselves reworking our lives to address this lack of a common now, um, but there are examples in our day-to-day -day lives that work behind the scenes to deal with this reality. One of the most obvious examples is the creation of time zones that attempted to make a more common now across the Earth, linking up the 24-hour clock that we, of course, invented um, with the movement of the sun uh, in the sky. Uh, even more hidden yet tremendously influential um, is the need to address the issues of time dilation when synchronizing times between the Earth and the satellites orbiting above it. These objects and their onboard clocks differ in both gravity uh, and velocity from the clocks on Earth, and this discrepancy must be built into position calculations for anything that depends on satellites. So I personally find this suggestion that uh, a now is something that's universal and shared amongst everyone somewhat defeatist and lazy. Um, yes, we could say that time is the same for everyone, that my time um, somehow uh, sets the universal metric uh, for the world. Um, however, I imagine that uh, things will be much richer once we begin to consider the possibilities of a vast network of times and how they interact. Henri Bergson is certainly one of the go-to philosophers of reference here. His thinking in the books uh, Creative Evolution and Time and Free Will lay out a philosophy of time that is only experienced. And due to its unpredictable um, process of becoming, it is the generator of novelty in the world. Time for Bergson was far richer than the minutes and seconds that he accused Einstein and other physicists of leaning on. Again, uh, for more of this, you should refer to Hermione Canales' book uh, called The Physicist and the Philosopher. Uh, there were clearly some misunderstandings between the two men on the subject of time. Einstein famously quoted once that, quote, time for the philosopher does not exist, unquote. Of course, he could not have predicted that even physicists in the future would also begin to argue about whether or not time even exists. No real solution of the conflict was had, as the methods of proof and argumentation between philosophy and physics are in many ways incommensurable. One thing that did bring these two ways of thinking together was the rejection of Newton's objective time. Time was observer specific time depended. Now this could lead us in many directions, um, but I'd like to use it as a way of discussing another predominant preoccupation in landscape design, that of the non-human. Bergson's idea of continual becoming, although not much else that I can find, are echoed in some of today's contemporary physicists like Carlo Rovelli. While literally anything is possible, far less is probable. Rovelli describes the impossibility of predicting the location of any one electron at any given point in time, as they exist in a kind of superposition, which is in all places at all times. However, this changes when the electrons interact with something else. An event is necessary to mark their location or their speed. From this view, no individual particle matters. What matters is the relationships between them. Particles come together and separate in time, making and unmaking the things that we know and experience. Rocks tend to stick around longer than clouds, but both are events in time. From this perspective, we can see a landscape as a series of events without any objects. Um, and so we can also think about this at different scales, the idea that a series of, of particles, atoms, um, and uh, molecules uh, end up creating 
um, grains of sand uh, and how those grains of sand uh, end up coming together at a series of a point in time and creating what we might call a beach in the landscape. Uh, we would have a very uh, similar condition looking at a forest and understanding this combination of bark and moss and pine needles um, at a really small scale, um, how those like, temporal interactions, we'll say, are necessary to uh, create something that we might think of as something stable like a, like a forest. The things that we imagine the landscape to be composed of are nothing more than tempor temporal configuration of particles that just stick around long enough for us to identify them. They're a collection of knots, tying and untying until energy runs out. But there is value in considering them as entities, even if they are highly temporal. We can't simply throw our hands up and say, since everything is constantly transforming from one thing to the other, that we must conclude that there's no reason to do anything. This unfortunate outlook overlooks two things. The first is that while things are continually changing, how they change is still up for debate and modification. We have agency in that process. The second is that the entities themselves have value, even if they are temporary. There's a good reason to consider the life um, of another being, be it human or non-human, as something more than past plants and future mulch. There may also be value in considering the perspective of each of these entities. Um, uh, they could be seen as having their own durations of time. Um, and so maybe, yes, I've slid to the point where even rocks um, can experience things in some way. And while maybe not comparable to us, uh, they probably have some agency in the, in the world. Uh, and so there might be some benefit in thinking about that. Uh, now, there, are, there might be people that actually think that rocks have uh, objectives and trajectories, but we're not going to get that far. Um, we're going to stay a bit simpler and consider a recent book uh, by Marsha Bjornjerud. Um, and uh, the book is called Timefulness, where she has a, a kind of a really nice quote um, that, that is, rocks are, are, are or should be considered verbs and not nouns. Um, this general call to arms of this text is understanding the value of relating to a geologic pace of time. Michel Serra in his book, oh, and also this geologic pace of time is something that certainly was embraced and leveraged by artists such as Robert Smithson, uh, of which the spiral jetty uh, is, is, is in this image here on the right. Uh, philosopher uh, Michel Serra in his book, The Natural Contract, describes the social implications of these various times. Serra reminds us that the French word temps defines both time and weather. Using the analogy of the peasant and the sailor, he describes the past uh, uh, when we were required to understand the time of nature as opposed to the time of the clock. Um, those who make decisions, specifically called out by Sarah as the journalists, the administrators, and the scientists, they do all of their work indoors, and they tend to operate in a short-term manner, even though our world operates in a long-term manner. Um, there is a type of oppression that comes about by thinking at the, at the short term. And so this temporal disconnect has a profound implication to Sarah. Uh, two images here are two images on the left are images that we produced um, looking at the kind of the movement of a storm across the sky. So thinking about time and weather in this case and in the center image, uh, linking aspects of weather. So the idea of, of trying to um, kind of tether or link together ideas of heat um, and wind uh, and how we might uh, explore their relationship in different unique ways. And while it is impossible to experience the duration of, of living or non-living entities, we can be incorporative and respectful of them. This was, uh, this, what, what's next is a simple and relatively old chart that we made when we were working on the third, uh, a piece for the Third Coast Atlas that indicated the time cycles of important entities in the coastal environments where we were working. Um, and we understood that they were incredibly different and this difference really, really matters. Um, artists have also done interesting things that I think begin to link up durations, or at least that's how I might interpret the work of someone like Tim Knowles, um, who looks at the relationship between wind and, um, wind and trees and, and how that, uh, that relationship can be indexed with different types of vegetation, um, or Cameron Robbins, who develops relatively elaborate, um, uh, we'll say, um, weather machines as, as ways of, of, of scripting and drawing um, different pieces of artwork. In the Healthy Port Futures work, um, we're also uh, attempting to reference and integrate different timescales in the design process. So this is the Illinois Beach State Park project that I mentioned earlier. Um, 
but we're going to focus here on the right hand side and and so in this area of the of the coast we have a coast that's been built up over thousands and thousands of years um, which has developed a basically a series of of, of, of ridge lines you can see the shoreline here um, these ridge lines are old shorelines that uh, existed thousands of years ago uh, and then we have um, and then on the on, and then also it, in the in a shorter time scale uh, we have we have a shoreline that is um, eroding and moving at a much more fast rate based on water level fluctuations over shorter durations of time. And so how we can be incorporative of both of these time scales, one at the thousands of years and ones in the decades, um, is a huge challenge because, uh, uh, because there are um, certainly different, um, different agendas of, of control that have to, be, uh, have to be referenced here or addressed. Um, so time depends, uh, and there are more times than one than the one that we simply experience. Uh, and as we think about our world, considering the different durations of the ent entities we interact with could lead to a more egalitarian approach of how we design it. This approach would attempt to be incorporative of the durations of as many entities as possible and consider how their interactions might matter to one another. These multiplicious durations intermix and form a landscape of events, continually affecting one another and fueling the future and the novelty it brings. Um, and so this image here is from uh, the thesis project of James Billingsley last year. Um, his project called Sensitive Infrastructures uh, was, a, was a proposal for the McMurdo uh, Research Station in Antarctica, where he identified a series of, uh, of, of his, his definitions of hyperobjects, uh, a term from Timothy Morton, um, that were in many cases environmental forces um, that extended the bounds of kind of formal logic. So you have swarms of these skooka, these birds, um, the trash that is generated from the, from the local scientists, the wind that blows over across the mountains. Um, these sorts of things uh, were, were designed then to interact with one another and the architecture and landscape architecture of the site was designed to be sensitive and incorporative um, of uh, these forces in their um, proposed interactions. And so this is at least an example uh, of maybe something that is a successful, uh, a, a successful attempt at what I'm advocating for here for design. So the last, the last uh, frame we'll talk about is uh, something I'll call all the forks, or the value of thinking in multiple dimensions. And so we've explored some of the physical and philosophical thinking on the idea of time and made some loose connections to the practice of landscape. That said, I also think time offers us up the opportunity to think about more speculative possibilities, possibilities that might lose their grip on reality and logic and consider the speculation of time itself as something valuable. I deeply enjoy the imagination of Jorge Luis Borges in this way. In his short story, The Garden of Forking Paths, it's a radical exploration of what we call a multiverse theory. In physics, the real founder of this theory was Hugh Everett, based on a paper on wavelengths in 1957, um, but versions existed in literature and philosophy well before this time. Borges actually wrote his story in 1948, and most agree that philosopher William James was the first to use this phrase in 1895 when he described a moral multiverse. Going back to physics, the multiverse idea is one of several theories that are continually squabbled over debating the relationship between quantum and classical scales of the physical world. Uh, but honestly, the calculations that are wielded to make arguments in this realm elude me. Uh, however, uh, many will attest that the thought experiment alone of the multiverse has led to constructive theories and ideas uh, in physics, philosophy, art, and design. The garden, in the Garden of Forking Paths, Borges describes with shocking accuracy the central premise that Everett would propose through physics decades later, uh, effectively that all possibilities are explored in different or parallel worlds. Everett's theory dealt with the forking of quantum states that create every possible outcome. Borges's idea, or the idea of the liberate labyrinth creator Sui Penn in the story, was that he, quote, believed in an infinite series of times in a growing, dizzying net of divergent, convergent, and parallel times. This network of times which approached one another, forked, broke off, uh, or were unaware of one another for centuries embraced all possibilities of time, unquote. In this way, uh, there is a reality somewhere where every possibility is true, but you only get to occupy one of those worlds, or perhaps two during a convergence. This idea that everything happens at all times is, uh, like is close to this idea of superposition we mentioned earlier in quantum mechanics, where the interactions become the most important things, the points of convergence where worlds crash together. Uh, we'll go here. 
So the intermixing of times is also a common theme in indigenous science fiction. Here, the term slipstream, a term that, ha a term that has several definitions, is used to talk about the sliding of characters from one reality to the next. It is one method used in what is called survivance storytelling, a term that is most commonly attributed to Anishinaabe scholar Gerald Weisner. Uh, he defines survivance as an act of indigenous self-expression in any medium that tells a story about our active presence in the world now. He goes on to state that, quote, survivance is an active sense of presence, the continuance of native stories, not a mere reaction or a survivable name. Native survivance stories are renunciations of dominance, strategy, and victory uh, and, and victimization. In his 1978 story, Custer on the Slipstream, slip uh, Visnor evokes Im uh, imagery of General George Armstrong Custer, someone correctly understood by indigenous Americans as a genocidal madman. At the start of the story, Visnor states that Custer likely has the world record for reincarnations, essentially that he and his atrocities remain in the indigenous storytelling of native people across the country uh, to this day. Um, in the story, Custer is reincarnated as Farley Border, a member of the Federal Department of Labor, where his task is to serve tribal peoples and the poor, um, which is somewhat of an ironic turn. The story hints several times that people around him have an idea of who he really is, still a deeply evil man. Um, and yet, uh, and then at the end of the story, uh, Farley uh, Border is, uh, is of course, um, upset um, by a a vision that he has and is uh, riding his motorcycle home and sucked into the slipstream of a truck and is killed. Uh, the image you see on the screen now, continuing the theme with Custer, um, is, a, is, a, is a performance piece, so this is just the visual component of it, called Horse by Archie Petuous, who is a Cree artist, um, multimedia artist. And the story here is a, is a fictional tale, um, or we'll say a parallel, a parallel tale uh, of a series of the of the, of the horses associated with the Battle of Little Bighorn, uh, which is where Custer was defeated. Um, and in this story, the horses prior to the, the, the battle um, come together, um, realize what's, what's occurring, um, and basically stop the, the battle pr prior to it starting, um, or at least in the process of it occurring. Um, and then um, because of this, they, they kind of remove themselves from helping humans for um, forever. Um, and so they withdraw from humans and they take with them the rest of the animal people as well. So um, their penalty um, for this is the, is the removal of the animal world basically from, from the human world. Um, so again, just reiterating this kind of like the power that, uh, the, the power that Custer has um, in some of these, some of these stories. Um, so I ventured off into make-believe and time travel, and so why might any of this third frame have to do with landscape design? For me, it feels somewhat obvious. Uh, the thought experiment of the multiverse is an experiment about time, or times more accurately. Um, we must look beyond what we think we know in order to truly grasp its significance. Thinking about what matters, um, thinking about it is what matters. It's not that it's unified logistically. Um, it is a speculation. And while it could rely on probability, there's no reason it needs to. The reappearance of Custer is highly improbable, but the power of the character and the reconsider of, reconsideration of him in a parallel dimension at a different point in space-time leads to a highly compelling imagery that also helps tell a story of both suffering and new histories. It is a rhetorical device used by Weisner to both transcend beyond victimization without forgetting the pain of the past. I think there's an important lesson here, so I'll get to it. Uh, the role of speculative storytelling as a way of building alternative narratives of hope uh, without forgetting the atrocities of the past feels like a genuine task for landscape design if I could imagine one. Um, this role feels even more pressing today when our world is factioned by fear and hate and so many could benefit from a hope that doesn't just propose something different while ignoring the past, but that uses the past as a generator for that hope. Uh, the stories don't need to be physically real in order to have a valuable effect. Um, so I want to sum up the frames, go back to them quickly. Um, and so in frame one, uh, the past is no future and the problem of prediction. Um, the takeaway was that we should try to be more creative in our speculations of the future. Um, we should in empower anomalous events and their and conditions uh, and to consider the design process more as an experiment and not a solution. Um, in frame two, between tree time and bee time, um, or the subjectivity of now, the idea that we would reconsider the landscape as a collected series of events and not things. 
um, we should acknowledge, incorporate, and empower multiple times beyond our own because there is no common now. And in the third frame, um, all forks are the value of thinking in multiple dimensions. Um, we should use the possibilities of forked, looped, divergent, and convergent times as a method of speculative storytelling, um, because there is, of course, as we believe, like value in that, in that storytelling. Um, so I'm going to conclude by downshifting to something quite standard and practical. Um, the landscape historian John Bergerhoff Jackson and his discussion of a sense of place. If we can momentarily agree upon what the definition of a sense of place might be, that it is the qualities of a particular geography that make them memorable to the senses, Jackson argues that this feeling, this genus loci, is not attached to the architecture or art of a place. Instead, he believes that it is the events of a place that give it purpose, not its physical constructs. Jackson continues um, to assert that a sense of place is actually a sense of time. Crazy as it sounds, um, even looking through Jackson's somewhat old landscape history lens, um, we see a, a representation of, uh, of Ravelli's ideas that time is actually made up of events, not things. Pushing this further leads us to conclude that if the most influential components of landscapes as places are indeed events, and time is composed of events, then landscapes themselves could be understood as time, meaning that our job is to understand, reconsider, and design time itself. Um, this may come by way of, now it sounds crazy, of course, but this may come by way of new considerations of what time is and what time could do. It may also come through an understanding of landscape and time as a collection of events um, that we have some ability to orchestrate and modify. So if we think in this way, then, then obviously time is real um, and it's easy to define because it is the medium that defines our profession. We design time itself. We don't design with time um, or in time, we actually design time. Um, and so. So I will leave you all with, with that. Um, I really hope that uh, this project has uh, at least inspired some curiosity on the subject matter of time um, and maybe help, will help inspire uh, your, your future work and engagement with the, with the subject matter. So I will, um, with that, I will stop sharing. Um, and I will conclude and say thank you all very much for coming and uh, um, yeah, goodbye.